heavy laden, says the Lord. And the psalmist would say, come, let's worship the Lord together. It's great to have an invitation this morning to come into God's presence, to know him, to enjoy him, and to serve him. Now, somebody is watching you. That's the title of today's talk in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 25. And let me start with the easy ones. Cloud watchers look at the clouds. Stargazers look at the meteorologists look at the railway buffs look at the trains. Twitchers look at the and photographers I guess look at everything. A harder one or two then. Um, herpetologists look at. If you're a herpetologist, what would you look at? Herpetologists look at reptiles. Here's another one. Uh, geocaches or geocaches. What do they look at? Anyone know? They know a geocache or a catchy, you have a GPS system and you find a hidden box of treasure somewhere. So use satellite technology if you're a geocacher. A curtain twitcher is a nosy neighbor who lifts up the curtains and looks at people. Um, people are watching stuff all the time. Did you know in the UK there are 25 million, well, there are 25 million cameras. Globally, it is estimated there are approximately 25 million CCTV cameras. And Britain holds the record, the highest percentage, with around 4 million CCTV cameras watching you as you go about your business. Now, today's sermon is entitled, Somebody is watching you. I guess that's physically true if you take those stats of CCTV and all those people doing their various hobbies, you might be watched. If you look at our bird cam uh, online, you see Penny going into a little room and doing something in the background. You can watch Penny if you're a nosy neighbor, but don't be one. Now, long before CCTV, long before a curtain twitcher term had ever been invented, the Apostle Peter says here in verse 12, somebody is watching you. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see as they watch. They may see. Notice what he says. Not that they may hear your great sermons or listen to your great songs. Rather, he says, they will see your good deeds. And Peter is really saying actions do speak louder than words as far as non-Christians are concerned. Now, so far in our studies, our first study was Walk in Hope, chapter 1, verses 1 to 12. Our second study was Walk in Holiness, chapter 1, verse 13 to 21. Our third study was Walk in Harmony or Unity, chapter 1, 22 to chapter 2, verse 12. And today in our latest study, it is Walk in Humility or Walk in Submission. That's the big idea in the passage, submission. And let's be honest, it is not a word that grips you and excites you and gets you kind of, uh, preach it brother, preach it kind of ministry, is it? In fact, if we're honest, we don't like to submit to other people. We much prefer when other people submit to us, when they like our preferences and they like to do things our way. Then we're happy. But when we have to do things their way and submit to their ideas, it's a lot tougher. Now, we're going to zoom through this passage on submission. That's the big picture. There's a lot I won't cover because of time. And I'm going to make seven points this morning. And that's something to scare you, isn't it? But I've timed it. Three minutes per point. So 21 minutes will all be over, okay? Let's get on with the first one. First of all, notice the command for submission. Verse 13. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake. The NIV, the New International Version, says submit. The New Living Bible uses the word accept, and this, the, the Good News Bible has the word obey. Submit, accept, obey. Submission simply means a bending to the authority or control of another. It does not mean the one who submits is inferior to the other. Rather, it's, a, it's the idea of just common sense, things functioning, things working together. You had it this morning if you drove here to church. 
If you came to that roundabout just down the, uh, a few hundred yards away, you submitted to the cars on your right. And if you refused to submit, <laughs> crash. But because you stopped and you submitted and you let that car go and you waited for an empty space, it functioned properly. It worked. And that's the idea behind the idea of submission. When you submit, things work functionally, orderly. And when you don't submit, accidents happen. So submission does not, the, does not mean inferior. We're told actually in 1 Corinthians 15, 28, even Jesus submitted himself to the Father's will while here on earth. And of course, Jesus could say, not my will be done, but yours. And taught us in the Lord's Prayer to say exactly the same. So it doesn't mean inferiority because Christ submitted himself to the Father. But for things to work orderly, functionally, it takes somebody to submit, to submit. Now in this letter, and as you will see over the next few, few weeks, submission is the theme for quite a few studies. Today it's submit to society at large. Next week when Steve Gillam's preaching, it will be submit in the workplace. The following week, submit in the home. And the week after that, submit in the church family. So there are four sections coming up, all to do with submission. Now I can tell, I can, I can see the cogs going around in your heads. I know exactly what you're thinking. You're saying, yeah, hold on. You don't know what the authorities are like. You know, submit to Boris and that bunch of jokers. You're joking, aren't you? And th there may be people in other countries, people in Moldova. Do they submit to a corrupt government where bribery gets you everywhere? I've got a friend in Venezuela who's posting every day on Facebook about the corruption in his country. Submit to them? Well, according to Peter, yeah. Some of you are saying, you don't know my work situation. You've never met my boss. Submit to him? Some of you are saying, you don't know my home. You don't know what my partner's like. What, submit to them? Some of you are saying, you don't know my church. <laughs> well, you know, submit to that bunch. Hey, that's what Peter says. And if you scan down to the end of the passage, verse 22 to 25, no matter what your government is like, no matter what your work situation is like, no matter what your family is like, and no matter what your situation is, it won't be as bad as Peter's and it won't be as bad as Jesus, who was beaten and tortured and executed, and yet he submitted. So if you think you've got a raw deal, think again, because in comparison to Jesus and to Peter and to these people scattered by persecution, our situation's not too bad. Now the point of a passage like this one is this, God expects his people, you and I, to respect authority. And we show respect by being good citizens, by seeking to obey the laws of the land. We may not agree with those laws, we may not like those laws, but we seek to obey them unless those laws contradict the word of God. And then we are in our rights to say no, no. So we don't submit to every law without thinking or questioning. We have to use our conscience. We ask the Holy Spirit to give us clarity. We open up the word of God. And if the laws of the land contradict the Bible, we are perfectly within our rights to obey God rather than men as the Apostle Peter said when they tried to stop him preaching in Acts chapter 5. Now again, this was a tough situation for the original readers of this letter. Shaw Kernan says this, Nero, who was the emperor that Peter told them to obey, Nero embodied tyranny and madness. In his shadow, most modern political bad guys look like peace figures. Nero killed his own mother, he had both his wives executed. He murdered thousands on a whim and lightly burnt down Rome on purpose. He mutilated a young boy to turn him into his husband. Nero was so hated that for centuries there were countless false stories about him. Historians of his, of his era made it a point to bury him and present him as a hyper-tyrant, as a form of retribution. At the time Peter wrote this, evil was dominant. Homosexuality, infanticide, government corruption, abuse of women, immorality and violence, just to name a few things. 
And yet Peter doesn't say, you defy those authorities. In fact, he says the opposite. Obey them. Obey them. So whether we like our government or not, I did come across this story this week. Uh, Boris Johnson and his cabinet were meeting for lunch in a very posh restaurant. The waiter approached and said to Boris, Sir, what would you like? Boris replied, I'll have the roast beef. And the waiter said, and the vegetables? And Boris said, well, you'll have to ask them. <laughs> we might not like our government, but we're to show them some respect. I don't know if that joke just uh, undoes the point I'm trying to make. Apologies to Boris and co. if it does. Hey, it doesn't mean we can't protest. It doesn't mean we can't oppose laws. But it means that for the common good of this nation, we seek to obey the laws until they cross and oppose God's word. So that's the command. What's, why should we? What's the motive to get us uh, obeying this? Verse 13b. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake. The Good News Bible says the Lord wants you to obey all human authorities. So we do it to please our heavenly Father. Elton John is a well-known pop star. He released his autobiography just over a year ago called Me. I didn't buy a copy, but I heard it being read or excerpts from it on Radio 4's Book of the Week. And whether you're a fan of Elton John or not, he's a huge music star. He's the fifth highest-selling recording artist of all time. He was the first musician to enter the US album charts at number one. He won a Brit Award for his outstanding achievements on three occasions, and he owns six gold, 38 platinum, and one diamond album for sales. So he's a big knob in the world of music. And uh, it was quite interesting listening to his autobiography because he said this, those things might oppress, impress the public, but they didn't impress my dad. His dad was called Stanley Dwight because Elton John was real name is Reg, Reg Dwight. He was not impressed. He was a flight lieutenant in the Royal Air Force. He never once attended a show by Elton and he showed no pride in his son's success. Their re relationship was strained until he died in 1991. And in his autobiography, Me, Elton admits he spent his whole career, quote, trying to show my father what I'm made of. And then in a BBC interview, he said this, quote, It's crazy, but I just wanted his approval. I'm trying to prove to him that what I do is fine. And he's been dead for almost 30 years. How sad. Lived his life, always trying to win the approval of his father and never able to. Now, as Christians, we are called to please our Heavenly Father. He is not a reluctant uh, father like uh, uh, Stanley Dwight was. He looks at our lives and he says, you want to please me? Well, submit to authorities. You might say, he'd say, well, read your Bible, pray a bit more, go and tell others about Jesus. And of course, there's a place for those things. But it says here, if you want to please God, one of the ways we show it is that we submit to him. Here's the third thing. The extent of our submission. The extent of our submission. Verse 13, submit yourselves to the Lord sake to every human authority to every human authority whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right i mentioned uh, moldova earlier on in our service if you want a moldovan joke uh, let me tell you one they were under communism for 50 years and uh, even if you go to moldova today i've, I've preached in moscow not the one in Russia, but the one in Moldova. So Russian village, and everyone speaks Russian, and even though it's in Moldova, the whole way of life is Russian. And there's a joke told that uh, one of the people went into a post office and asked for a stamp. And he complained to the cashier that this stamp is not sticking to the envelope. So the cashier says, let me see what you're doing. And then the cashier says, comrade, you are spitting on the wrong side of the stamp. That's a Moldovan joke. They didn't like their leaders, so they spat on the face of the leader instead of the sticky side of the stamp, if you didn't get it. Now, notice the breadth of this instruction. Every 
human authority. Boy, is that broad. Boy, is that wide. Boy, is that expensive. Extensive, sorry. From the person at the top to those down at grassroots level. Why, verse 14 tells us. Because they are appointed by God. Their responsibility is to govern well. And if they govern badly, they'll answer to God for how they have governed. And the point is this, we respect the office even if we don't respect the person. That's what they say in the army, isn't it? If a sergeant major is a horrible person, you obey him not because he's horrible, you obey him because he's got stripes on his uniform. You respect the office even if you don't like the person. And we're told here, we might not like every individual law. We might not like the institutions that enforce those laws, but we can still submit... Because we respect their authority until they break the laws of God. And then like Peter in Acts 5.29, we say, no, we must obey God rather than human beings. So from the big knobs to the little ones, we seek to obey them. Here's the next one. The reason for submission, verse 15. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. The message paraphrase it this way. God wants you to silence stupid and ignorant people by doing right. It literally means you muzzle your critics. You silence. You, you put a muzzle on foolish people who are out there pointing the picture, uh, pointing the finger at Christians. We silence them by doing good, not by opposing authorities. Foolish accusations come from the mouths of foolish people. And Peter doesn't pull any punches. He calls them stupid and ignorant. Stupid and ignorant. We live in a world full of stupid people, don't we? I did come across this story this week. A a man phoned the emergency hotline frantically on the phone. He said, my wife is pregnant and her her contractions uh, are only two minutes apart. Well, the person at the end of the phone says, is this her first child? And the man replied, no, it's her husband. (laughs) Stupid people in a stupid world. But Peter tells us there are those who oppose Christians and go for them. They criticize them. They watch them and they find fault in them. And the way you muzzle them, the way you silence them, is by living a good life and submitting to your authorities. And when Peter wrote this letter, boy, were they being criticized. They were being accused of cannibalism because they came together to eat the body and drink the blood of Jesus. Now, we know that was symbolic. They had bread and wine. But to the non-believer who didn't know the facts, they said they're cannibals. They meet together and they eat flesh and blood. They were accused of incest because they had a love feast. They were accused of incest because they were always talking about loving your brother and sister. And it was misinterpreted. They're accused of atheism because they worshipped an unseen God and had no altar idols whenever they met together. They were accused of treason because they said Jesus is Lord when everyone else said Caesar is Lord. So people looked at them and misinterpreted what they did and accused them of all sorts of things. And the way you silence them, says Peter, is live a good life and obey the laws of the land. That's how you muzzle your critics. Next one, the attitude of submission. Verse 18, verse 16. Verse 16, live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Again, the message paraphrases it. Exercise your freedom by serving God, not by breaking the rules. Listen, at your conversion, you were set free. Free from condemnation. As far as the Bible's concerned is, your sins are forgiven. Even past, present and future. We're free from the law's penalty. We don't fear separation from God. Spend an eternity in hell. We know we shall be with God. We've been set free from the, the penalty of the law. We're set free from Satan's bondage. He need not have dominion over us. We are set free from the world's control. We don't have to go after the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. We've got a new life to live. We've been set free from even the fear of death. Death has lost its sting. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 
But Peter says, just because God set you free doesn't mean you can just live any old how and do any old thing. Don't use your freedom as a covering for evil. Don't go out and do something and say, oh, well, I, I could do that because I'm free, I'm forgiven. Covering indicates you put a mask or a veil over some for it. We all know bad people wear masks. That's why bank robbers wear them. We all know, oh, you've all got masks on, haven't you? <laughs> but normally, in COVID times, it's normally bad people who wear masks because they don't want to be found out. And Peter says, don't wear a covering for your evil. Now, freedom is not an excuse for licentiousness. Uh, you know, a, a church member said to her pastor, I don't understand why you, you preach against sin uh, for Christians. I can understand you preach against sinners, but why are you preaching against sin for, for those who are forgiven? And the pastor said, uh, you're quite correct. Sin in a Christian is different. It's far worse. Just like when a police officer commits a sin, it's far worse than the, a member of the public. You expect better from someone who's a police officer than Joe Public. That's why when a royal family is in a scandal, it's all over the papers, we expect better behaviour from them than Joe Public. And when a Christian commits sin, it's far worse than an unchristian because we should know better. We claim to have the Holy Spirit inside us. We claim to have the Word of God empowering us. So we should live a purer, better life. So having the right attitude is important. Here's the next one. The application of of submission verse 17 show proper respect to everyone love the family of believers fear god honor the emperor if you want to apply the principles of submission he tells you four ways to do it first of all honor all people show proper respect hey everyone's made in the image of god everyone deserves respect do you know, in the early church, there was only one place a slave and his master was equal, and that was in the early church. They came as equals. I was listening to a, a preacher this week who's a pastor in Kenya, or was, he's died now, uh, who was a pastor in Kenya, had a big church in Nairobi for many years, but when he was in the UK, he would preach at Westminster Chapel. And he said, when I preached at Westminster Chapel, and if the president of Kenya, who was President Moy at the time, was in London, he would come to Westminster Chapel to hear me preach. He said he would come in at the back of the church, and he'd already sent a message, don't tell anyone who I am. When I enter this building, I am a worshipper like everyone else. I am not a president. And the only place a president and uh, Joe Public are equal is in the church of God. In the early church, the only place a slave and their master were equal was in the church of God. We are all equal. So honour all people. Secondly, love other Christians. The brotherhood of believers. you think that would just be taken as a granted, wouldn't you? You know, fish do not attend classes to swim, do they, Boaz? They don't go attend classes to swim, but they do, go to, they do swim in schools, don't they? So figure that one out. Birds do not attend classes to fly. They do it automatically. It's their nature. And Christians ought not to be told, love one another. We should do it automatically. It's supposed to be our nature. It's God's nature. God is love. should be our nature. Thirdly, fear God. Fear God. Respect God teaches us respect for others honor the king which brings us full circle where we started in verse 13 honor the king give to caesar what is caesar's and give to god what is god's and finally the example for submission is jesus verse 21 to 25 he says three things about jesus just to kind of summarize really he was mistreated, abused, and killed. Secondly, he says, he was our substitute who died upon a cross. And thirdly, he is our great shepherd who watches over us. Watch the example of Jesus and copy. Years ago, people used to have wristbands and bookmarks and badges with the words WWJD. It wasn't for the World Wildlife Foundation or Worldwide Wrestling or whatever. It was, what would Jesus do? 
And that's what Peter says here. What would Jesus do when injustice come along? Well, we know. We know. He suffered. In fact, he warned all who follow him will suffer, so it ought not be a surprise. When he faced unfair treatment, he didn't curse his, or speak out. And you know, for most Christians in the world, they face unfair treatment. That's called the persecuted church. So he says, learn from Jesus. He's our example in life. He's our substitute in death, verse 24. He bore our sins in his body on the tree. In other words, you are not perfect. You've got faults galore. So why do you expect your leaders in government to be perfect? You're not, so why should they be? It's not an excuse, but it's just a realism. They are sinful people ruling So they will do it in a sinful way. Don't be surprised. And then thirdly, verse 25, he says, you have a watchful shepherd, the overseer. So remember, even in your suffering, God is not distant, he is with you. Keep trusting, keep trusting. Well, we've run out of time, let's pray. Lord, we pray you will apply your word to each, to every heart, for we ask it in your unique and special name. Amen. Let's conclude with a song.